Good morning. Welcome to Sunday service here at DCC. Y'all go and sing with us to get in worship. Hey! during worship David got up and started talking and I could have just started right then but I was reminded of something you know your brain is the motor or it's the tool but it's not your mind it's not your will and emotions 
before I finish saying that, I do want to say that standing up talking to people is a fine balance between wanting to make you upset and stir you up, but not make you so mad that you leave. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You follow me? So, <laughs> for some reason, I was thinking to myself, you know, especially men, and I know I'm hard on us, but we're the man of our house in all these ways, except for the spiritual side. Yeah. Boom! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying and it wasn't lightning, lightning striking me dead so I know it was alright <laughs> but before I finish saying what I'm saying I want to say that because I have let me tell you how much me and David have planned this Sunday all the work that's went into me and him planning what just happened this morning and what's about to happen is that he said, can you preach Wednesday or Sunday the 5th? I said, yes. Done, planning. <laughs> but what I'm going to preach about is called, I titled it, The Way. Being on the way. But finish what I was saying about the mind and the brain. The brain's just a motor. It just does what we want it to do to make our fingers move and me hold this microphone and open my mouth. When this worship is going on, men, we're not saying those words that pop across there to let God know that he's all those things. We're saying it because he deserves it and we need to let it come out of our mouth. Because the you sitting in that chair, some of y'all may have water in your house, some of y'all may have stuff flooded, but that you doesn't want to say all those things. So the you that knows better, and I'm going to tell you this, and it may sound weird, but the you that knows better needs to say it out loud. So that the brain hears it. I'm not asking you to be a famous singer. But say it out loud. You need to hear what you're saying. Sing it out loud. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying this is part of being on your way to him and becoming who he wants you to be. You come to him as you are. And he accepts you. But in order to change and change your mind, you need to hear the good news and you need to hear yourself say it. Your spirit, man, forces your soul to tell your brain, say this, dummy. Because when we're left to our own, we need to eat, sleep, and recreate, right? Procreate. That's what an animal is. And what separates us from an animal is the ability to contemplate, a conscience. And we have to retrain this brain to appreciate who God is. I'm going to read you all a quote that I read Wednesday night. First of all, you know what? I'm, you know what? She said a while ago, the next Wednesday is you can't outgive God. Actually, that's what I preached for Nick. Wednesday. So I'm going to re-preach that real quick and then I'll do what I was going to do. <clears throat> God created you in his image. He's a giver. He gave us Jesus. Then he redeems you so that you can be and live out what he created you to be. So giving's not just about money. It is necessary to function for this AC and this rain that's not hitting us right now. <laughs> but giving is money, time, talent. Talent's the most, I mean, time's the most valuable thing we have. Can't get, you can't get it back. 
He expects you to be a giver because he's a giver. So I'm going to sum up Wednesday's sermon with just give all of yourself to him. He'll give it back. You be a good steward and don't act stupid. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's Wednesday night in a nutshell. <laughs> I'm going to read you all this quote because it is a, it's a profound statement. It's from A.W. Tozer, his book called The Knowledge of the Holy. And it's such a comforting thing to just think along the lines of what he says here. And he says, How completely satisfying it is to turn from our limitations to a God who has none. Eternal years lie in his heart. For him, time does not pass. It remains. Those who are in Christ share with him all the riches of limitless time and endless years. God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this is to quiet our spirit and relax our nerves. Man, when I read that the other day, I started crying because I was stressing. You know, I know I'm not supposed to, but I was nervous about things. And when I just put God in that perspective that we can't really comprehend it, but when you acknowledge that he's that big, that there's nothing bigger than him, the biggest thing you can conceive is not even close. All the universe and everything we know about in science is little compared to him. So I thought it was interesting what David started talking about this morning because like I said... My, uh, my first scripture is John 14, 6. And like I said, if this, the title of this is called The Way. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I had this idea. Man, that's a good scripture. I'm just going to preach on the way, the truth, and the life. And I started putting notes together. And I, I kind of said this Wednesday. You may ever see those YouTube videos where they drop the Mentos in the Coke bottle? It blows up and just keeps coming out. <laughs> it's like a volcano. Out here, here's a better example. You know when your mama sent you to the pantry and said, get that can of green beans. You open the door and go, it's not in there. (laughs) Yeah. That's not a good way to study the word of God. (laughs) And and I feel like (coughs) at times, I don't I like the shoe fits. I'm not, I'm not pointing any fingers. Just saying, that's right. We've all been there. If I can look for something in here that tells me I can do this, even though I feel like it's wrong, if I can find something that makes it okay. Or just the opposite. But (laughs) when you begin to contemplate the Word of God, it swells. And the more I read about the way, the truth, and the life, the bigger it got and the more they all became the same thing. In a, in a debate, uh, the, the Christian thinker, John Lennox, in a debate, he said, um, yes, I believe in absolute truth too. The difference between me and you is at the end of all of our thinking and reasoning, I believe truth is a person. And that person, we will all come to find out is Jesus. And that's what you'll come to in every part of what you read. Whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, if you keep looking, you end up at him every time. 
So I'm going to talk to you about the way, how he is the way. At some other time in the future, maybe I'll get a chance to talk about the truth and the life. <clears throat> when you take the word from the Greek that Jesus said it in, it means a way, a road, a path. We use, it, we use the word way like this. No way, that's not the right way, do it this way. Which makes, it's very interesting. It takes a little bitty word you never consider. And then we consider all the different ways we use it. And it, get, it starts to get big. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a person. But the end is the way of death. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. <clears throat> so I've got five points I want to go through about how Jesus is the way. First of all, number one, He's our only way to God. Matthew 7, verse 13, starting in verse 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. But the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. And there are few who find it. John 10, 1 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. 10, 7 says, Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Continuing on in John chapter 10, verse 9, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. Right there, the way stops being a path and starts being a single point. Our way to God is Jesus. We're going to build on this, but it's important to note that along this path that David was talking about in this travel, and it's funny that we say, when these struggles get in your way, you're assuming you're on the way. Well, on what way? You know, if it's in my way, you need to start considering if the things that are in your way are those things in Christ or are they outside of him? Are they part of living? Are they in your way because you're going a direction you don't need to be going? Because he's, he's cleared the path for us. It's not that we don't have struggles that don't mean the path don't go up and down. At the top of the hill, it feels good. You're free, you can stretch your arms out, but there's no provision up there. All the fertility is in the valley, and all the fruit is down there where it's fertile. That's where things grow, including you. On the hilltop, if there's no struggle, there's no pain, there's no, then you just stay who you are. And if you're on the path, being, being created in his image, being living in the nature of God and becoming the joint heirs like that song said, we have to, because we're not perfect, we have to continually become more like him, more like Jesus. If you're not following me, just slip your hand up because I want you to hear what I'm saying. God, let my words, let your words come out of my mouth today and let them hear what you want them to hear, 
and do away <laughs> with the stupid things I say that they don't need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to cover all my bases. <laughs> and if you were thinking that about me just now, I forgive you. <laughs> Number two, he is our way of escape. So you see, you better forgive me. <clears throat> see, David, I told you I need to sit up here behind you and commentate while you're preaching. Just whisper to you. I get you all messed up. <clears throat> you have to be slapping me. No, that's not true. Don't say that. Number two, he's our way of escape. Not that we're escapist, but while we're on this path to him, we have to remember these things. In James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, But each one of us is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when the lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. James chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 says, Submit therefore to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye du you double-minded. You can't be double-brained. That's how we know there's a difference. You can't be double-brained, but you can be double-minded. You can have two minds. You got to feed one or the other. And that's partially why that path to him is like this. Because <laughs> we're still living with the old one. And we think that's who we still are, but Jesus made it and gave us a new one. <clears throat> but don't worry. Is in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Also, so that you will be able to endure it. Which got me to thinking. God's our provider, so he provides a way for us to resist that temptation. Whether it's our own flesh or the enemy attacking us, we have to understand. We, we have to understand that we, when we give in to sin, it isn't because it's overwhelming us. It's because we've turned into it. It cannot overtake you. God gave us a way out. If we will turn to him then the sin will cease. Whatever it is that's got you and got you doing whatever it is you're doing, us, we give into it, and that's exactly what it is. We're on our way to him. And when we get our eyes off of him, just like Peter in the stepping out onto the water, we get our eyes off of God, and we turn to the sin. And that way leads to death. Just the opposite of where you want to go. Because it says right here that he's given us the power and, an, and a way of escape. That when that temptation comes, turn your head. I heard a guy say one time, the biggest, the, the most miraculous thing God ever gave men when it comes to temptation was a neck. <laughs> if you're tempted, all you got to do is Turn your head. And listen, just don't be like Lot's wife and look back. You never know what might happen. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure she's clothed now. Nope. <laughs> yeah, just turn your head and walk off. Be a man. A real man. 
That's right. To overcome it, we just turn away from it. We turn to what God gave us, his word, his redemption, the confidence in him. That's how we proceed. This part, the third part, he is our way into the holy of holies. It goes a little deep, but I think the foundation of who we are as Christians and what we have to know is that If you don't know anything about the Old Testament, you don't know anything about the law of Moses and the temple and the the tabernacle, all those things, that doesn't matter. What you have to know is that there was no one allowed into the Holy of Holies because God was in there. And if you walked in there, you would die. Twice a year, a high priest could go in there. But it was after a long series of ceremonies and dipping things in blood and sacrificing animals that he was permitted to go in there and he still had little bells and pomegranates around the bottom of his robe and they had a rope tied around his ankle because if he was trying to hide something and went in there and he fell dead they had to drag him out somehow that's how serious of a thing we're talking about when when this talks about this in Hebrews and what Jesus did for us. I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but it's in Hebrews chapter 9. Jesus became the sacrifice and made it. Not only was he not with the sacrifice, but he he was the veil that was torn to let God's spirit out of that holy of holies and made it so we could come face to face with our creator, each one of us on our own. That's how big of a deal from one minute when he was breathing on that cross and the moment he gave up his life. You go back and read the scriptures. It says that the veil was torn in half from the top to the bottom. Go read about it. I don't mean green beans. I mean, go look at it. It's a serious thing that Jesus did for us. God's awesome. We can know that Jesus died for for our sins. We build our life on that firm foundation that he is the Christ. And we can build a house, like I said Wednesday, we can build it out of sticks or straw, whatever you want. Whatever you want your quality of Christian life to be. It don't mean you're going to hell. But what you build on that foundation is up to you. What kind of relationships you establish and what kind of life you choose to live while you know that truth is totally up to you. While you're on your way. Hebrews 5.9 says, And having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Number four, he is the way of truth. Second Peter chapter two says, starting in verse one, but false prophets also appeared among the people. Just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their indecent behavior, and because of them, the way of truth in the New American Standard says maligned. Who's got a King James on? Anybody, Anybody? What's it say instead of maligned right there? I meant to put that in here. Okay. I did put it in there. I just... The King James says the way of truth becomes blasphemed. This says maligned in the New American Standard. So I looked up that word, and it does, it does directly translate. See, there you go. There's your background for the King James. It's pretty dead on. In the Greek, it means blasphemo. 
to slander or to speak lightly or profanely of sacred things. So these people that twist and turn the gospel to you, sometimes not even the gospel, we like to believe things that, and we take them as truth. Godly, cleanliness is next to godliness. God will meet you halfway. All that stuff. Those are, I know that sounds simple, but that's a scary thing. To tell people things that it does not say in the word. And those are simple things. You know? Concise language. Use words that mean what they mean, not what you think they mean. Yes, I, I'm with you 100% on that. If we are, if we are in him, <coughs> yeah, please don't mean that I think quick cleaning your house. <laughs> there, speaking that word to say to do good to your enemies is like heaping coals on their head. There was a, <laughs> there was a, some missionaries went to a native tribe. I heard this when I was in Bible college the year that I spent there. Uh, and they went to these people and they got ran out, but they had left partial pieces of scripture they got to go back in a year later and part of their ceremony they would put people in the ground and dump coals on their head they said what are y'all doing well that book you left has said that's doing good for them (laughs) yeah so that's how you know the whole eat drink and be merry my grandma used to say that all the time with a big miller light in her hand I read it for myself later, and she, didn't, she never read the verse after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can find whatever you want, but it may not be what you need. In verses, well, let me finish that. So that word means to blaspheme or, or, or to take the truth, twist it so that people talk bad about it. And that's what we're fighting right now as Christians. You can get on YouTube and there's plenty of people who take what we teach, not what the word says, but they take what the church teaches and rip us to shreds in the world because we're teaching something that's not in the book. So they can take it. And we have no grounds to stand on. We don't know how to argue against it because the Bible doesn't say it. So it turns the truth. And people blaspheme God because people teach the wrong things and call it God. I hear my my grandbaby over there, Jude. Started saying dada. Mama. Mama. Anyway, verse 3 of that, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 says, And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Verses 15 and 16 says, Abandoning, abandoning the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the reward of unrighteousness. It means he liked living in sin. But, the, but he received a rebuke for his own offense for a mute donkey in the New American Standard says a mute donkey. King James says a dumb donkey. <laughs> See, I was going to say it, but then I felt like I was saying it just, because, just to say it. So that's why I corrected myself. See, God convicted me right here. I even have it written down right here. A dumb donkey speaking with a human voice restrained the insanity of the prophet. You don't know the story of Balaam? They kept asking him to prophesy against God. And finally, the donkey he's on didn't want to go. He sees the angel. Finally, the donkey turns around and says, why are you hitting me? Can't you see this angel standing in front of me that's going to kill us if we go that way? So Balaam was the prophet of Baal, who's a devil. But 
people listen and they hear what they want to hear so that they can do what they want to do. But just like in worship, it's not about what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. You can sing and say all kinds of words with good music behind it. But if you don't know why you're saying it, you, your why, not why I'm saying it. You got to know your why. Look into it to enough to, for you know that it's important for you to do that. I can tell you, yes, it is important for you to do it. But you got to know why it's important. Number five, he is our way to righteousness. In 2 Peter, still in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, it says, For it would be better to know for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it and turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. As it has happened to them according to a true proverb, a dog returned to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns, returns to wallowing in the mire. That's where we end up when we choose, when we get off the way. We end up going back to something. Then we look like a fool. Because we proclaim something different. We know something different. And God says right here, it's better that we had not known the truth in the beginning. Than to return and roll around in the sin that we lived in before. Then we look foolish. Before you were ignorant. Now you have the knowledge. And you look like someone who should know better. We all know that. We look at people and think, well, they don't know no better. And then you get really mad when you say, they know better. You know, with your kids. When they're little, they don't know no better. As soon as you teach them to know better, then you start getting that butt tore up. <laughs> Save their life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to, uh, became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is the way. And also meaning, I am the way by which one passes. He's the one with whom everybody who everybody seeks to approach God and he's the one that we have to be in closest fellowship with in our life. Not your wife, not your buddies. All of those people will benefit if the closest relationship you have in your life is Jesus. It will transform everyone's life around you. I want to explain something to you about this way and hopefully paint a better picture I said this, some of this Wednesday night, but when you compare the three major religions of the world, it's a general consensus that they're similar, especially if you ask people who don't know any better. But if you consider Judaism, the Jews who believe in the same God we believe in, but in a different way, the Muslims, and Christianity. People would sum it up by saying, at some point, everybody has an initiation into that faith. You come to some knowledge. And then you start on that path. You walk the path until you get to the end. And then at the end, there's judgment. Our Bible teaches this. We can read this in our Bible. if you don't read the New Testament. But when we reach that door, all these major religions, the way you get on the other side of that door is by merit. What have you done? Did you follow the commandments? Did you do what God asked? And the world would say, this is basically how these religions work. But that's exactly not what Christianity is. 
Jesus said it, and I just read it to y'all. He's the door. And we come to him at the beginning. He accepts us upon initiation. And we're not expected to walk this path without him. He brings the kingdom to us. We confess him. He accepts us and lets us through the door and says, Now, walk this path with me. Read this book and it will tell you how to walk it. He comes into a relationship with us. We're not waiting to know him. We know him now as Christians. And we walk through this life on the path with him. And if you'll pay attention, you'll realize when you step off the path. I'm not saying any of this in judgment. I know this is a serious thing. But I want you to know that when you say these words, that is you. I don't care what you feel like. If you've confessed him, you are a joint heir in the kingdom with him. You are in him. You have his righteousness. When you come to that door of judgment and you've lived a life believing that Jesus is who he says he is, it's wide open and you just step right through. It's not about how good you are. It's about how much you believe. And if you've confessed Christ, then he's given you that inheritance. Live it. Use it. Be it. And become more like him every day. Life will be so much easier. I promise you. I've tried it both ways. It's so much easier if you'll just consider what Jesus thinks. Not only consider it, do it, even if it hair lifts everybody around you and makes them mad and they snarl at you and get mad at you. You can only do, I can only do what Jesus asks me and tells me to do in this situation. And then you let him work everything else out. That's, that's what living this life and walking on this path is about, is that if you do the book, In your life, you'll get the blessing. He won't turn his back on you. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for these people. Lord, we bless Nick and his travels. Be with him, Lord. Give him strength. Help him be the man of God that we know he is in every situation that he faces this week. Lord, all this water and everything going on around us, Lord, we ask that you strengthen and encourage these people. Because everything, just like when you stepped out of the boat onto the water, all of this is under your feet. We turn to you, regardless of what looks like is happening in the world, we turn to you and everything else fades. So we reach out, Lord, and we bless those people that are in these situations. Some of them may be sitting in this room, Lord, I don't know. But let them know that you're in control and that you have control of the results. And you'll never leave them or forsake them. Father, we thank you for this morning for your word. We thank you for this time together as believers, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.